let you know that obviously we have access to the outside uh, and there are some refreshments out there. If you need a restroom, you can go out this door and go to the end of the hall and there are restrooms where you can go back the way that you came in, go to the front desk and down the hall and there are restrooms there as well. Um,
so I'm glad that it's a, the type of space where I feel like we can engage because I'm less interested in presenting to you for an hour and a lot more interested in just engaging. So I'm going to do a little bit of the, the spiel around what self-directed education or SDE as we say. Um, I will talk a little bit about what that is so that we can all have some general, like a general idea as Kiana said of what it is, how it shows up, um, and that it is a common thread in spaces like this. But I also am going to be hopefully engaging. I do want questions. I do want to um, go beyond the basic idea of another form of education. Because that's what really, really excites me about self-directed education, is that it isn't just another approach to how a kid can learn stuff. It's so much more than that. And for our family, uh, we are unschoolers in particular, which is just one type of self-directed education. So that's where I'm going to start. All right? Yeah. All right, cool. So essentially, self-directed education is just education that centers the learner and that isn't necessarily done with a specific goal of learning something or proving that you're learning something. Because generally, in learning or in education, you feel like you can see what it looks like. The kid is sitting there with a the book. Odds are they learn. That's, that's our assumption. Um, and they can prove it because they take a test and they get a good grade and that's very much been the, the basis of how we do education. Self-directed education disrupts all of that and says that education is the responsibility of the person learning. Education is the responsibility of the person learning. And so when we talk about the dynamics of young people and adults, the focus of self-directed education is as adults with more access, more privilege, how can we support each young person in better understanding who and how they are and how they learn without getting in the way of who they are and how they learn? And I think that is, like, why wouldn't I go everywhere that I can to talk to people about it, right? Because it is such a beautiful way to be in community with people. And when we talk about the dynamics of adults and children, self-directed education is more than just okay, I'm going to help my kids to learn and help them feel like they have a say. It, for a lot of us, it is civil rights work also. It is social justice work also. Because generally, conventional education, which is different than traditional education, we'll talk about how in a little bit, but conventional education is oppressive. It says that I have the information and you are this empty vessel, and my job is to get you to get the right information and to prove that you have the right information, which also makes me look successful and true and right. So in that design, there's a lot of oppression because it doesn't include the perspective and the needs and the ideas of the person being educated. So self-directed education says, pause on that. How do we get to a space where we have a better understanding of what learning might look like for each person and what supporting learning might actually look like. Right? So Kiana mentioned the Alliance for Self-Directed Education and I want, for anyone who's not familiar, the website is self-directed.org. It's a really great space. I'm really grateful to be in community with those folks because you will get to see in great detail the definitions of education, of self-directed education in particular, and also education in general. And you can also work through in your own time that difference in the idea of education as most, most of us have been groomed or I say indoctrinated into, versus um, learning, which is a very different thing. So I'll start with a little bit of background of how our family got involved. This is my partner, Chris, here. We have two daughters, Marley and Sarah. Who are 15 and 13, and I love saying that they don't get good grades, they don't excel in school, they're not on any honor roll because we're not in school. Um, we are an unschooling family, and I'll back up a little bit and talk about the different types and then um, end up with unschooling. So, self directed education will take a variety of forms. You have the Philly Free School, 
Are there parents here who, besides Corey, whose children are at fully from school? Okay, right? So you have that model. Um, the Sudbury model is one particular type, and then you have Agile Learning Centers, which is a different type. Um, you have some that are not schools at all. You have self-directed spaces that are learning centers, like Agile Learning Centers, but some of those register as schools. But you also have cooperatives, for example, in Atlanta, uh, where we came here from, there is the Anna Julia Cooper Learning and Liberation Center, which is a collective that is based on a queer black feminist polity. So their work is around liberating young people to learn in a way that makes sense for them, and also exposing them to the black queer feminist roots, because for that group of people, that is how they came up. That's what activism looks like for them. So self-directed education is, is almost always a form of activism. It doesn't mean it's not problematic in its ways, right? Um, so that feels important, especially now. You know, I was talking to my friend Malika, who runs a collective learning network here in Philly, and um, I was saying to her that in doing my research around Philadelphia, I'm recognizing the history at a very cursory level, I don't have a lot of knowledge on it, but it feels really important um, and special to be here talking about self-directed education, uh, particularly around the idea of indigeneity, right, and the ways that in this city, what happened, you know, to get to the point that the city is at now, like who was removed, how they were removed. What are the dynamics in the space? And we're here from Atlanta, we're here from the South that has all its own issues with indigeneity um, of that, and blackness and how that's viewed or villainized and all of these things. And for me, self-directed education has very much been a space where we can have those conversations too. Because generally, in school, you're in this bubble and you're very much focused on your grades and your testing, but you don't know much about the city that you're in. You don't know much about your neighbors. You don't know much about the people who look differently than you do. You know, the history of what has happened for somewhere to be what it is. You know, even in this particular space, I it's wonderful the type of organizing that has happened in this in this space. So we are now a part of organizing that's happening in this space just by being here together. And that feels really special to me. Um, so for our family, we very much started out. We very much started out as, um, like, like maybe many of you, we started out focusing on education, alternatives to conventional education, which, as I mentioned, is different than traditional education because traditionally, in terms of the history of groups of people, education was not always oppressive. Education was collaborative. Children learn organically. They follow adults around. They play and was intertwined with learning. They weren't separate in that way. They weren't put in positions to prove that they were learning something based on a systemic idea of learning. Right? <laughs> they get um, you know, they were using tools of their time to learn and grow together. And that's what self-directed education is. And so for our family, it started out that our daughters, who as I said were now 15 and 13, they were in public school, public elementary school, and they were thriving academically, but we could see that their personhood was being assaulted in a variety of ways. Um, race was tied into it. Being in the South, um, our oldest daughter Marley was called a scared little black girl by another student. And we didn't hear about that from a teacher. We heard about it from her. Um, there were issues with her and, and also with Sage, with both of our daughters feeling uncomfortable asking questions, feeling nervous about being wrong. You know, just the things that we as adults navigate all the time. The reason why most people are afraid, for example, of public speaking more so than that. <laughs> is because we're afraid of like saying something wrong or showing up in a way that doesn't match how we think people view us. These are some of the things that happen as a result of forced schooling. So we started to experience those 
course we experience it also as children ourselves, but it had become so normalized that it, become, it turned into something different when we became parents because we could see it as, you know, for what it was. So after about, well, like two and a half years of our daughters being in public school, we chose something different. And it was still conventional education because it was a virtual academy which still had a K-12 and still labeled children by their grade levels as opposed to like their humanness. Um, so we did that for about seven minutes before we quickly realized that <laughs> what we needed was to back up and offer some space. Um, and not from a space of being like woke and blah, blah, we just got frustrated. So we were like, okay, let's stop with the schooling, let's stop for a couple of weeks and kind of feel it out and see what happens and that's been like eight years. <laughs> that we just went further and further um, away from the idea that we needed to force our daughters to be or show up or perform in a certain way and that our work was to really be advocates for their right to develop as who they are. And that that development in self-directed education doesn't mean that as a parent I don't also get to share or introduce my belief system. It just means that I don't force that on my child, and that I don't paint my child with a brush of who I think they should be, just because that's what happened to me. And, and that is really the, the core of self-directed education. So as we continue to, to pause from the idea of what learning will look like, then an emergent structure showed up and we started to recognize that learning and institutionalized education were two very different things. And that one is toxic and harmful and the other one can very much be liberation work. You know, the work of what I call raising free people. Because in doing that, you also raise yourself. You also recognize that so much of parenting and caregiving comes from trauma. So much of parenting and caregiving comes from what happened to us that we either didn't address or what happened to us that we're so pressed to make sure that that doesn't happen to our kid that we end up doing another version of that same thing. And I'm seeing a lot ahead now because as adults, we survived a lot of childhood things that are not inherent to childhood. And it turns out that schooling in its conventional form is also not inherent to childhood. That isn't the way that learning happens. But we have fears around that because that's all we've seen. And so self-directed education, the movement, is about normalizing organic learning in ways that don't shut out culture, in ways that don't erase who people are or who people have been historically or who people want to show up as. Because as parents, you know, and, and sometimes these terminologies can be jarring, but this is the space for that. Oftentimes, we colonize our children under the guise of giving them a better education. Because colonization has become ingrained in how we see the world and in some ways how we navigate the world, we feel like we have to take over something and own it in order to be with it. And self-directed education says, that's not how that works. <laughs> if, if you're doing something, if education is to liberate and to elevate, then you can't keep using those same tools of oppression and expect to have an outcome that is about a free person, this liberated person. So in an Agile Learning Center, for example, because I'm familiar with that model as well, and I value a lot of aspects of that model. I'm loving this way. <laughs> um, in an Agile Learning Center, um, the liberation work looks very much like emergent structure. It looks like having tools in place that don't decide what a day should look like, but instead empowers the learners and the staff to develop an environment of learning that is ever changing because people are ever changing. Like, are you the same person that you were 10 years ago, maybe even 10 weeks ago, depending on what happened, right? Odds are no, things have shifted. But in school, when our girls were in school, they were learning pretty much the same things that Chris and I were learning in school. We're in our 40s. 
So it allows you to pivot away from these things that have just been happening because that's what we're used to and allows for an emergent structure, right? And in that emergent structure, we start to humanize our learners and we put personhood in front of studenthood, right? Because so much of education has been about becoming a certain type of student, showing up a certain type of way, getting the paper that proves now that you are learning and that you are valid and valuable. But I can tell you as a college graduate, you know, having done all of the schooling, that the value is more so about validation. You don't, you don't become more valuable. You become a person who is continuing to seek external validation, which you will never get enough of. So that carrot is always dangling. So you try to get more education. You try to get the right partner. You try to wear the right clothes. You try to do all of the right things when the work is really about who am I and how do I learn and what are my needs in this space. And that is very much liberation work that just happens to look like education. <laughs> and I feel like um, going back to the, the idea of the, the history of Philadelphia and even a space like this. This space, did I read, is that correct that it's a uh, designated a national historic area, right? So, in, in honor, in a sense, I feel like being here and having this conversation also honors the people whose land we're actually on and honors the work of what it means to be yourself and feel safe to be yourself because there are so many children now who do not feel safe as themselves. They present a version of themselves to their, to their everybody, to any adult, to their parents. I work with a lot of families who I probably know their kid more than they know their kid. Not because they're not great parents in many ways, and not because they don't love their children, but because their children are afraid to show up in ways that don't match the checklist that we as parents sometimes put in front of the person that our, that our child is or that our children are. I want to pause here for a second and um, sort of feel through if I can get a gauge of, does, is any of this, as you're listening to this, is there resonance? Like, do you feel a sense of connectedness to the idea of education and liberation not being vastly separate things? Okay. Yeah? 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 Good. 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 Because really, that's, that's what this is. Because when we think about the purpose of education and the work of education, it's not about how high up you can go in the rankings of things. There's a depth to education that I think self-directed education allows for in a way that is unique to that movement. And I call it a movement because, again, it's more than a mere education model. And I even have um, some notes on some things that I wanted to touch on. One of them is the idea of presenting versus being present. That is one of, I think, the most empowering aspects of suffering. One of the most empowering aspects is that we spend a lot of our lives, and as adults we know this, that we are very much often in presentation mode. You know, not just in terms of how we dress, but how we show up in the world. We present a version of ourselves that we think is going to make the most sense in a space, or that, is, that feels the safest in a space. And we also then hide the other aspects of us that we think will make us less safe, or in some instances, do make us less safe. So that's why it's hard for us to talk about the sort of things that I talk about all the time, like race and civil rights. My focus is on black, indigenous, and people of color in self-directed education which affects the whole world and all people, but it also allows for a centering and an examination that by peers of black indigenous and people of color really get a to do because so much of our work has been about presenting the version of ourselves that allows us to feel safe. And so it, then that plays out in our parenting because if we're not safe, then we really have to lay on the pressure in order for our kids to be safe. 
That's the narrative. All people feel that, but there's a, diff there's a different set of layers that happens for our POC folks. And when we are in community together, then that is an opportunity to have the sort of conversations that just don't happen in other schools. Because when you have children together of all different backgrounds who are doing liberation work together, and parents and adults, caretakers who are in that place too, it doesn't mean we get it right all the time. It doesn't mean that SDB spaces are not going to have a lot of the same issues. But the difference in self-directed education spaces is that there are tools in place, whether people choose to engage those tools or not. There are tools and conversations that are constantly happening that allow us to move past how things have always been over to exploring what they might look like if we can actually have these conversations. So that's what I want to do here too. This is not, I'm not gonna chat for an hour about the different forms of SBB. That's why I gave you that website also. Self-directed.org and also my podcast, Fair with Free Child, which you can listen to wherever you listen to podcasts. We talk about education beyond the conventional idea. This is why I'm always so excited when people invite a person like me in particular because is you have a really good idea that we're not just going to talk about, you know, the general idea of education. I want to touch on as much as we can in a short time, and as much as it can feel safe for folks. I want to touch on, and I'm always curious about why people choose it. And I think more of us need to hear why other people choose it, because it helps us to get free. It helps us to get free from a lot of the indoctrination and trauma that we introduce into our parenting and educational practices and in our neighborhoods. It helps us to recognize why we don't talk to our neighbors because we are afraid of them or they are afraid of us. But if your kids are together in a space and your kids love each other, that's going to do a little bit of disarming. Even if it's just the tiniest bit, it can open a door and can create a pathway. So I want to sort of shift over into that now. Is anyone comfortable here telling us why you choose self-directed education or why you are exploring it? Or I can volunteer. Can I see your hand? Yes, please. as well, but it is, it is very much that it is love centered. And for us, I'll go a little bit into unschooling, that's what the big appeal was for that because it took away this idea that as the adult, I should pretend, because that's what we do as adults, that we have all the knowings, that we know all the things, we have all the answers. It takes that pressure away and it makes it communal. If I'm talking to my daughters from a space of seeing them as my guides as much as I am theirs, it changes so much of how we can relate to each other. It changes from a space of performance over to a space of trust. Because education generally is not trust-based. It says that I feel really sure 
that you don't have enough of these things to make it as an adult. So I'm going to give you these things and you're going to need to prove these things. And once you either turn 18 or do enough of these things, then somehow, magically, you have everything you need. That's not how that works because we know lots of adults who really didn't move past like age 12 or 13 in part because they never learned how to trust themselves and they didn't feel trusted. Like it, a lot of my own work as an adult, my personal work is about really getting deeper into what it means to trust myself and to trust my choices. If no one validates my choices, am I okay? Are they valid? These are the sort of things that we allow space for in self-directed education, whereas in conventional education, that doesn't happen. You don't have that space because you're so busy presenting that you have very little room being present. And in that presence is really where you develop what learning can look like for you and yours. That's why presenting versus being present is such a significant part of self-directed education. Um, and I'm going to continue also to give like explanations and definitions and examples, but I really would like for it to be interwoven with what's happening here for, for all of us. Anyone else want to share why self-directed education is interesting or a practice for them? No? Not yet? Okay, yes. Considered great things like being gifted, um, and others might be considered terrible things like um, oppositional client disorder. <laughs> um, and those two things are like such extreme. Like, like teachers might see one as like that's an amazing thing, and the other is like that's a terrible thing. Um, but like, no matter what, in a conventional school, they would be deciding what success means for him instead of letting him and us as his family supporting him decide what that looks like. So my kid is a kid who gets really, really into like one or two subjects and wants to go so deep into that and ask a million questions and think really hard and really analytically about those things and could care less about anything else that somebody thinks he should learn. And, and that's okay with us because he's thinking critically um, but this is sort of like that question attached to it, too, is that um, with neurodiversity comes a lot of challenges also in a communal setting. Um, so he's attending uh, Agile Learning uh, community right now and having a lot of behavior problems in the school. So the thing that my family is struggling with um, right now is how to balance freedom and structure for him. So that's sort of where I am. Thank you. Yeah, that's, um, I'm glad you bring that up. We have some level of experience with that as well with our daughters. Um, I like to say that Sage, she's 13 now, and she and Marley are so vastly different. Marley is like a social butterfly. You know, she was six years old. Hi, I'm Marley Richards. This is my mom. to organize a play date. You know, she had all of the like, checklist things that, that schools and teachers like. And she and Sage were labeled gifted and talented really early on. But then Marley's also, if something doesn't make sense to her, she can't move past it. Like, she cannot move past it. And it's like she needs some level of explanation, which is going to show up as like belligerence in a conventional system. Sage is the opposite of Marley. She doesn't want to do all the people in there. She, that, that's, she's who gave us that term. They're peopling on me, she would say that all the time. And it just took us so long to even realize, like, that's actually a horrible feeling to imagine that this thing is happening to you whenever you leave the house all the time for hours at a time. And she would, um, she's an artist, and she would spend hours, I mean like five, six hours, shading an eye. Erasing, I mean hours upon hours shading an eye, which would not be okay in the school. So the idea of balance, we tossed it. That's the first thing that I would offer to you, not as an answer, but putting something in the mix. We don't deal with balance, because I like to say balance is for yogis and flamingos. Because 
people are not balanced. For me, as a long-time entrepreneur, like when WordPress became the thing, I don't know how many nights I spent like trying to stay awake, immersing myself in WordPress and understanding it. And when Teachable came out, I was like, what? I could do my own courses online and Udemy before that. Like I spent hours. It wasn't balanced. And if you think about anything that you are passionate about or even interested in past a certain point, are you balanced in it? Are you spending 2.5 hours here and 2.5 hours here? And two? No. You're, you're really immersing yourself in a thing. But we have these really tragic ideas of childhood that says, oh, well, I need to be able to see what you're doing. I need to understand what you're doing. And I need to put these things in categories because that's how we've been taught. But really, it's not about a balance. What we embrace is more of a harmony, which, which I think is very different than balance. Because for us, when we talk about harmony, then we look at things like, OK, if our girls are spending hours on screens, which I know is like a bomb or a flag for everybody, we love it. Because we've learned so much about how they learn. And we've also learned how little we understand about learning as a result of how much time our daughters spend on screens. So what we do is we harmonize that with basic things like, OK, have you eaten, right? Or um, other people don't feel safe when you do this. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Do you not want to be in this environment because you're uncomfortable with these things? You make a, a contract, for example, with an ALC. You, you're making an agreement to do these things. So if you don't honor these things based on the agreement, then you're saying you don't want to be in the space. Is that what you want? Let's work through what it looks like for you to be yourself in a space. And also, let's look at what this space can do to nurture who you are instead of you conforming to a space, right? So it broadens the perspective. You know, and again, I like to use our specific examples because everybody's different. With Sage, with spending hours focusing on art and all these different things, we would say, oh, but she hasn't done this, or she didn't eat. Or then we talk about, like, what does it feel like when you're hungry? You're saying that your head is It's because you haven't eaten in this amount of time. Now she regulates that completely on her own. It also allowed Chris and me to start learning about Ayurveda and learning how people have different doshas, like different body compositions, which call for different things. So everyone doesn't need to eat every few hours, and that's real. Like, there, there's so much that you realize that you don't know when you back away from what you think you know. Yeah. And self-directed, yeah. And self-directed education gives you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to recognize how little we actually know about learning and how much we just are used to the performance. So when we have babies who are not about that performance life, what it does is it gives us an opportunity to figure out a harmony between the spaces that they're in and who they are and back away from this idea of the balance or the, you know, the, the checklist things that might make other people comfortable but then leaves your kid out completely, you know? Like we realized that we were not advocating for our own children when we were in school. We were like extensions of schooling at home because if they didn't want to do homework, our first question wasn't, what's going on with you? It's, why wouldn't you do your homework? You know, you won't get the gold star, you won't get the, you know, it went from that to, oh, she's frustrated with these particular things. And if I block that out and I'm supposed to be safe space as her mom, or Chris is supposed to be safe space as her dad, what is the message that that sends her about her right to be herself or to show up as herself in a space, right? And, and there's also, in this same vein, there's often a criticism around self-directed education, people have the fear that if you raise a person who feels free to be themselves, then that is done to the detriment, right? To the detriment of other people. That is also trauma. That, that mindset is also rooted in trauma. The idea that, and, I, and that's not a word I use lightly. That's not a word I use lightly, and I do mean to use the word trauma. Because we are so afraid of what it means to be ourselves, and we are so uncomfortable with the idea that someone might feel free, sometimes with good reason, okay? Because sometimes when someone else feels free, it is at the expense of someone else. But don't conflate that with 
what automatically is. Your, your kid being free to be themselves, or you being free to be yourself, you have a choice. The kid has far less of a choice. So let's focus on them. Your kid feeling free to say no doesn't inherently mean that they're going to resist everything you say. What we found, especially with Marnie, who was a very like no-centered kid, what we found is that the more we offered her space, the less combative, or that's what I viewed it as, the less combative she became and has become. People say, oh, you have two teenagers? Oh, I'm gonna pray for the girl. Huh? Like, no, 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 no. Of course we have our moments where people together, but there's so much ease and comfort in our relationship because we're building, not to say we've arrived, right? But we are building trust. They trust that, as Marley says all the time, that we're gonna respect the no. She says it all the time, respect the no. It doesn't mean that her no is something that I'm gonna automatically accept and not talk about what, you know, what I'm feeling or Chris isn't gonna talk about what he's feeling. It just means that she has a right and the space to express herself. It just means that she doesn't need to perform for me just because I'm her mother and I'm in a position of power over her. And I think at least a few of us here know what it's like to be in a position to have to perform for your parent. And it doesn't go away. It's not like when you become adult, you know, you're like, okay, I'm grown now. I'm gonna, you still do it. You still, okay, my parents are coming over. Let me change this, do that, do that. Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna go see my mom, okay? You know, we do all of these things and we treat it as the norm. It has become normalized. What did I do? That's not okay. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be. You, you can actually be yourself wherever you are, and self-directed education allows us communally to practice that in ways that can feel safe for a lot of people. Like, what does it mean to show up as myself in a space? What does it mean to think that, oh, okay, people hired me to do a talk so I don't have to wear, like, stockings, or try to speak like this because that's what everyone says is professional? Yeah. I, I don't want, like, little things, little things that are really big things because those things speak to your identity. I don't have to try to slick my hair back to be comfortable and safe in a space and show up as me. You don't have to dress up to come to a thing because that's what people do. These are little things that are not quite little because they speak to your sense of confident autonomy. Your right to be yourself and also other people's right to be themselves. And also an ability to have tools that you recognize when you're getting in the way of somebody else being themselves. That might be, that maybe it's not the most important part, but it's kind of mix. This idea that this isn't a selfish thing in a negative way. It's a selfish thing in a beautiful way. Because the more you do your work, and the more you're in community with other people who are also doing the work, the harder it is for you to continue to do these oppressive things because you're being called out, sometimes in loving ways, and you also start to understand your own privilege, and then you get tools, most importantly, to work through those things. And then you're not always having to do the work as the one person in a space, because now other people have a better understanding, and they have language and practice around something more trust and liberation centered. Anyone else want to share anything that's present for them, including any questions around self-directed education? Was that a hand or someone? <laughs>
you to speak it with. Um, my children are very efficient, and so they use the language that's going to get them what they need. Um, and English is more effective for them, so they tend to default to that. Uh, we did better with the older one than the younger one, because <laughs> he's heard even less Hindi. Um, and that's one of those things where I definitely feel like this is something we want for them more than they want for themselves. I think. When they're older, they will be glad that they wanted this for them and we sort of work on this with them, but it's not something that they're asking for right now. And I think this is one of the, the things that I struggle with with uh, software engineering is when you are kind of pushing against the time culturally, uh, you want your kids to be exposed to or go to certain ways of being, ways of uh, thinking that are not the ones that are the path of these resistance, right? Yeah. And it's not always going to know what the value of those things is until they're in yeah. um, So I don't know, I guess I'm not just looking like any thoughts that you or anyone else has on this. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I definitely would like to open it up if anyone else has perspectives on that. And um, I hear you. So we are Jamaicans and our daughters were born in the US. <clears throat> but there are definitely certain Caribbean values that feel really important to us, right? And values, that is another space where oppression is around right? And there's a lot of things that we as adults do under the premise, and I'll speak for myself, and I'm trying to call you out, that, um, that we do under the guise of like, yeah, you know, when you're older, exactly the same language, you for us, this is what's useful. The reality is that I cannot say conclusively that, it, that certain things will be valuable for Marley and Sage. I believe they will be. I believe it with all my heart. But I don't know it conclusively. That's useful for me to say, okay, actually, maybe they maybe they won't know it all. But then there are other things where I'm firm, I don't care what you say, and that. So it's to try to navigate that space. And so this is what's important to recognize that self directed education just as it is, the work of it is anti-oppressive from the adult-child dynamic, it also is anti-oppressive from the perspective of cultural values. So in other words, as the person who's partnering with my child, they also get to know me. The same way that I have a, a right and, and a desire to know them, I also desire for them to know me and they also desire to know me. So I introduce, and Chris and I do this, we introduce it, um, introduce things that are important to us, but we don't push past the no. That's where that phraseology of mine is, like respecting the no. So there are certain books that we wanted them to read, and so we use a lot of strewing. And that's a term that's used a lot in unschooling, but it's really useful in self-directed education across the board. S-T-R-E-W-I-N-G, strewing. Is that a familiar term to some? Right, so all it means is just introducing different things into an environment or introducing different environments that allow a child to have an opportunity to be exposed to a thing. But it also allows them the opportunity, it's, it's allowing that opportunity while respecting their human right to say, I'm not interested in this now. And also you recognizing that interest, our idea of interest is also coming from a very schoolish mindset. So if they don't read the books that we want them to read, it doesn't mean that they're not interested in that thing. We could speak the language that we think is you know, interesting or, or important for them, but that is true. You're offering it, but you don't have to force feed it. If you speak to them in that way, in their understanding, then you've given them that. But they now have a right to decide whether that's something that they will use going forward. So it doesn't stop us as adults, once again, from playing a role that also allows us to offer things that are valuable and valid to us, to our children, but our practice is figuring out, just like you said, trying to sort through essentially how not how to do that in anti-oppressive ways. So we do it by string. We introduce and we respect the no, but we introduce things consistently. I always use the example of the autobiography of Malcolm X. It was just so urgent for me that Marlon and Sage read that book that we ended up buying like, uh, like a ridiculous amount of copies <laughs> and just putting them in like every little the house when they were younger, like everyone, which is good. We had it everywhere. Sage never really read it. I think she colored some pages of it. 
Marley read it. But then she had some conversations with Sage about it. And then we watched a movie, and then there was some context, and then we talked about some of the speeches. And so it's really, it's not going to be easy, just like with your partner. You know, I, I like to put that disruptive thing in the mix too, to say sometimes when you're struggling with allowing freedom, which is its own problematic terminology, think about it as if this were my partner, if this were an adult, most times, not always, most times that's enough of a disruptor to say, if this person was an adult, and an adult that I cared about, and I just couldn't make them do what I wanted them to do, and I couldn't make them like what I wanted them to like, what might my approach be? How would my language be different? How would my body language be different? So it starts to arrange you self-directed education, because again, it gives you practice quite organically, sometimes from studies, sometimes from being introduced to certain tools, but oftentimes just from your own organic approach that is now human-centered and not coercion-centered. So that you'll recognize with your child, uh, for example, I'd recognize with Sage that she's really into languages. So that it allows me to honestly, not coercively, not low-key, not you know from the corners, because she sniffs that out, I try it all the time. <laughs> all the time, because I'm still doing my own de-schooling work, and she's like, mm -hmm. pause, right? <laughs> so all the time, I, I recognize, because she's into language, because she's an artist, because she's tactile, then I can introduce things that are important to me using those tools. Then she's often more receptive to them in that way. Or I might ask her a question, I'll say straight up, I don't know how else to bring this up. Like, you might be on somebody's couch, talking about how your mama forced you to do this or that or whatever, but it's because I don't know another way right now. It feels important for me that you have this information. It feels like a part of identity. It feels like a part of safety. We have those honest conversations all the time that, that we can say to our children, and it, I think it makes us more trustworthy when we say, I don't know how else to introduce this to you, but it feels so important that intuitively, I can't not. So that's one thing you can do. You can approach it, and I'm glad to see some nodding. You can approach it from a human-centered way. Approach it from the space of, if I wasn't able to force this person, if they didn't have to listen to me, what might I be doing differently? How might I be showing up differently to offer them something that I find useful? And it's just a constantly practice that. And to be in partnership with your children in ways that build that level of trustworthiness that they know. Man, this is beautiful that my mother is so connected to our culture and that they don't see it as your culture, they see it as our culture. That was really important for us, that our children connected to Caribbean culture, not as this thing that their parents had or did or whatever. And it's a part of why we became location independent, as in we we're not based in a particular place, we move about. And Jamaica is one of the places we move about quite a bit. So now our daughters have their own connection to the island and the culture, and everybody can't do it in that way, but you can absolutely do it in ways that not, are not about, well, I'm going to give you these values because you don't need these values. Because our parents tried to do that with us, and some of that was useful, but a lot of it was not. If we talk to a lot of our parents, we, we probably don't have all of the same cultural connections that they have, in part because of how they tried to convey that stuff in ways that we resisted, you know? Does anybody else want to speak to that, or I want to leave the space just in case? Yes. is when that idea of self-directed education starts to fall. 
because it also, it showcases that trauma. It showcases the expectations that you've had, whether it is this idea of, oh, I wish I would have learned that when I was this age. It makes sense to say that, but in reality, you do not know how you would respond to that information at that time in your life. So we have to give ourselves a little bit more credit. And I know we already have life as a clock, as a time clock for our existence. But we add the idea of compulsory education to a deadline that our young people have to be able to achieve and exceed within a certain amount of time. When that's something that really should be up to our young people for them to decide on their own. But we're adding this extra level of, okay, this benchmark says that they have to be able to read, write, speak, and do whatever these preset conditions say that they should. When in truth, are we allowing them the opportunity to really explore that for themselves and define those benchmarks on their terms? Or are we just an extension of the system that we so desperately want to be able to get away from, but from time to time see ourselves still being pushed in this arena? to replicate the same idea that has been just as traumatizing to us in this sanseric circle that we're doing for our, for our young people. Absolutely, expectation. <laughs> um, expectation is, is oppressive for, not just for children, it's also, it works the same for us, because again, a lot of us are really, like we survived our childhood. And I, and I don't mean, even in terms of safety, even if you were in a home where you were safe, there's still a lot of emotional, you know, like cognitive dissonance between who we are and who we've always needed to be in order to be validated in spaces. And self-directed education just says, that's not okay. And not only is that not okay, but allowing yourself, as you said, to give yourself the space to manage your own guilt about, I know there's a lot of guilt that I, I work with myself and around with other families around, oh, I did this thing to my kid and I did that, that thing to my kid. Look, a lot of times we don't do it knowingly, but now that we do know, because everybody in here now knows because we've been talking about it, recognize that you have tools and practices and language around you to work in community with people to do something different. And it is difficult, right? I don't want to romanticize that any sort of liberation work can be difficult. But it is also organic in a lot of ways. And kids get it. Like, especially if they haven't been introduced to schooling too much, even at home, kids get it. So if we can learn and practice together how to follow their lead a little bit more, we can see, because that's what happened for Chris and me, like a lot of it was just backing up and watching how Barney and Sage, for example, conflict management. And like I grew up in a household in an environment where conflict management was violence, you know, or it was verbal, you know, violence, essentially. That's who I, that's how I grew up. So that's the tool that I normalized. What? What? You know, like I'm ready. That's, that's kind of what I was steeped in. Watching Marley and Sage be really mad at each other, and then three minutes later, talking to each other from like really loving spaces. I mean, I was constantly bawling in a corner in the house somewhere, because it was like so much of my own education. It was like a deep schooling from the idea that I had to be aggressive, or seem aggressive in order to get my point across. The fact that I could actually communicate with somebody, and that I could forgive somebody, two minutes later for a thing that they did, or that I need to hold a person and their behavior all the time, sometimes, but not all the time, as the same thing. Like we are not always a choice that we make. Now if you continue to make that choice, that's a different thing. But you can make a choice in a moment that can hurt someone, and that person can forgive you in that moment. That was like a big aha for me because that's not what I came out of, right? So there's a lot of self-directed education that again, arranges you to recognize that so much of the work is not you, the adult, having the answers and being the sage who can give the information and pass it along and be the wise elder and all of that. A lot of it is observation. 
A lot of it is witnessing. And that is proactive work. Making the decision to back up and observe how something is happening is work. It's easier than stepping in and using the pretend, the pretense, and saying that you have the answers. You sit there, you sit there, you apologize to your sister, da -da 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 -da, which means nothing to them. They're performing. But if I back up and give the space, then I can speak to them from a space of how they've been, who they are. My suspicions match with my intuition, which is what a lot of parenting is for me. I think this might work, and this feels good in my gut. Let me test this out. That's what a lot of it is. But a lot of us come at it from the space of, but I'm the parent, or I'm the teacher, or I'm the this. I need to have the answers. I need to look like I have the answers. And everything around you says that. Right? We're penalized for not having the answers. But self-directed education says, let's explore this together. Let's see what emerges. Let's see which things feel like problems. Let's look at some of the ways that we can address these problems with the input of the people involved in it and not onto them, not pulling on them, as they would say, but working with each other. And in this living and learning a less lonely thing. Right, in school, it's like you, you need to rise to the top. You need to rise above your peers. You need to stand out. There are only this amount of scholarships. There's only this amount of this, that, and that. Self-directed education, to me, is particularly beautiful because if you're about that life, if you want to go that route, it doesn't stop you from doing that. There are plenty of tools in place, by the way, if anybody's wondering about the what about college, the what about math. These things that, I get it, I have those questions too. Self-directed education does not get in the way of that at all. Because if someone is inclined in that way, self-directed education allows them to lean into that, where they can immerse themselves in it for hours upon hours. And because everything is everything, whatever they're learning, there are going to be other skills that are connected to that they, that they absolutely learn too. So it allows you to do that while also saying, no one person needs to have the answer. You don't have to be so special that you specialize yourself out of a sense of community, that you disconnect from where you came from in negative ways. You need to disconnect from aspects of where you came from. And self-directed education gives, gives the space, again, in the language for you to do that too. To say, for me, as a, a Jamaican, there are certain things that I deeply value and respect and carry with me from my culture. But then there are other things, like corporal punishment, you know, like in schools and all of that, where you can be hit by a teacher or by anybody in your neighborhood, and that you pride yourself on, you know, kind of like what you survived in a lot of ways. I can disconnect from that. And in doing so, I can start to recognize that as colonization. I can recognize that as, oh, you okay, we were under British rule, and in order for my grandma's mom, to feel like her daughters and her sons were safe. She did all these things, including physical violence, because she did not have the luxury that I have to sit and say, this lady have to do this, son, that she didn't have that luxury. So she needed them to have a different sense of urgency than I can ever process. Not that it was okay, but I have the space to say, oh, this is why that happened. It's not a Jamaican thing to hit your kid. It's a, like a result of colonization work. And now I can do the decolonization work of saying, for me, physical violence is tied to what happened in slavery, so I don't do it because that's what I see it as. I don't think I would have had the space to do that because before we became unschoolers, I was in my daughters. Because that's how I thought you communicated to a kid who just wouldn't listen. A very different idea than what evolved when I had the space to say, wait a minute. So I was hit as a child, and the things that I was in for, I still child. So even from that perspective, it doesn't make any sense. And then if I want to have a trustful relationship with my daughters now and later, and if their dad wants to have a trustful relationship, how can we say, we are your safe space, but also, I'm going to be violent towards you? I never made that connection. And even when I made the connection, I didn't have language or practice or tools or people that I can converse with about it to shift out of it. Now, being immersed in the world of self-directed education, I do. 
I can talk to other people from different places who have similar experiences or want to be like, oh, my parents will never get me. And me being like, oh my God, what was that like? You know, and <laughs> so, so it just, again, it just arranges you in all these beautiful ways and, and also in really scary ways and also in painful ways. But all of it is growth. And, and beautifully, it's communal growth. Because we stick our children in these little classrooms, and they might get really good at the learning and make all the checklist things and go to the right schools and all of that. But then a lot of those people feel really lonely. They're not connected to community. They move to a whole other area and they'll never look back. Meanwhile, that same person can benefit from and be a benefit to their communities. And in a lot of the self-directed spaces that I'm part of or have the benefit or privilege to be invited into, I see that among the most marginalized people. Self-directed education as a way to develop collective liberation work. So it isn't a rich white thing, as we think about, you know, especially with unschooling. It's like, oh, you gotta have money, you gotta have this. You know, I, love, I was talking to Luke today when he picked us up to say, yeah, we're nomadic, and you know, sometimes people look at that as like a money thing, which is hilarious, because we're so but One of the main reasons that we move outside of this in the Christian community is because the U.S. is so expensive. It is so expensive to do a lot of things, especially because everybody's in their little silo. So you don't have a local farmer, like that's just becoming a thing in a lot of spaces. Whereas the part of the island that I'm from, it's really easy to get real food very inexpensively. It's really easy for our family of four to survive, and not just survive, to do well and eat well and travel among the island with a thousand US when we first started. Whereas here, that's hilarious. You know, that doesn't even cover rent in a space that would hold two people that are going for. So when I say that self-directed education arranges you, this is what I mean. Like it starts out being about education and how your kid learns differently or better. But it's really a liberation work. It's de-schooling and decolonizing from a lot of the ideas that we have about children and about community and about relationships. And it allows you to start to recognize a very different reality, a different especially among people and groups who haven't had the space to imagine outside of what things have always been. We get to imagine and test out what it means to live in liberation together, like what it means that I don't get in the way of somebody else feeling free. As a matter of fact, I can do the opposite. That's what the work is. And again, we'll be in spaces where it might look like something different, but I encourage us to not just up and leave a self-directed space, unless your family isn't safe in that space. But we have to look at ways to do the work, even if that means starting your own thing, which is beautiful too. Because whatever it is you start, I guarantee you, there's a bunch of people somewhere who are hoping that somebody has the space to start that thing too. And you can lend your light to that. And they can lend their light to yours. You don't have to stay and suffer in somebody else's space. You can start your own. And then by doing that, you can end up creating a form of education for that other group. I'm, and I'm speaking from experience. I'm speaking from, again, just having the privilege of being. The work that I do takes me to a lot of different spaces where people have to figure out how to help really come there you know, get to the space and all of that. But the work that's being done, people might not have a lot of financial resources, but when I tell you, the level of liberation work that is being done in these small communities is stuff that the world needs to have a better understanding of because so much would change if we are more versed in liberation work, which for us and for a lot of people, has very much come through self-directed education and what it does for a group of people. Because you can't stay in your space and be like, I'm this, these are my expectations. You can't do it in self-directed education. It's not sustainable. Because one, you have children who feel safe having a voice. So they're gonna smash that right away. <laughs> Which is wonderful, because as adults, we often need that. 
we also get a chance, as I mentioned before, to be in spaces where it's like, oh, I don't like her because of this thing, but then our kids love each other. So what does that mean? I think that's great. I think that's important. Sometimes that is a portal to work. And that's what it allows us to do. Or it allows us to say, I actually don't want to be in this space. What would it take for me to get with other people who share my values and for us to create something together? That doesn't need to look anything like anything we've ever seen. We don't have to care about benchmarks. Like Malika said, we can just focus on people and how this person doesn't care about reading at all, even though they're 12 and that they can be surrounded by people who do not vilify them or make them feel bad about them. Because they're uplifting their other skills, and as a result of that, you start to see the value in other people who don't necessarily have the same skill sets or background that you have. That ain't happening in school. <laughs> it's not happening in conventional education. That is the tradition of people being together, but we conventionalize ourselves out of tradition. And SDE is one way that we get to practice a more organic, human-centered, trustful, liberation-minded way of being together, particularly in the adult child Are there any other questions, any burning questions that folks have around what it looks like? I feel like I haven't spoken a lot to, to what it looks like or anything like that. How are we feeling? Do you feel like for me too because again my, my background is like grace weakness is that what you're saying like that's that's what I came from right so constantly I am continuing to de-school and what's really useful for me and I am going to give you some resources in addition to my perspective um, what's been really useful is to recognize the effects of colonization on my body and psyche now because it, it allows me to question why I need what I need from a kid when I'm saying that I need you to do this or show up like that, I'm now really practiced and not always getting it right, but always recognizing, what's that coming from? Like, what is that about? So I have this thing, mad question asking, which comes from a Biggie song, right? Um, but I love it and I use it all the time and I, I do a lot of writing and speaking around mad question asking. It's like to question your way to a different set of parenting practices. To ask yourself why you need what you need in a moment. To get really familiar with the idea that you need to say to your kid what you need and why, as opposed to expecting them to just know or to operate based on what you need in a moment. To put yourself in communities where other people are doing the de-schooling work too, so that you can have tools that make sense for you because what makes sense for me based on how my kids are and how I am won't necessarily make sense for you. Um, the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, that site, there's a forum. We have a forum and there are some conversations around de-schooling happening there. 
Um, I also have Dr. Sanjata and I created a course called How to Focus on Learning. And if you just Google it, hopefully it will show up. Talk a bit too about the de-schooling process, like what that means. Generally, the, the definition of de-schooling is about coming away from the idea of a schoolish mindset when it comes to education. But I think that it's much broader and deeper than that. I think that de-schooling is about realizing and practicing ways to move yourself from what happened when someone else had control of your body and when someone else had a lot of control over your thoughts. So we still parent and guide from a space of expectation from the space of even the expectations of ourselves. Like, I should have this much patience. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing that. Mm, not necessarily. Sometimes, like in any other relationship, it needs to be messy a bit from a more conscionable space. Sometimes it's a mess, right? Because that's what it is, because you don't have any tools. But as you begin to go deeper into de-schooling, it's still messy but it's messy in a different way. It's messy in a useful way. You can recognize, sometimes in hindsight, and then as you continue, even before you take that action, which is when it's really sweet, you can recognize what's happening for you, and then you relate to your child from that more intentional space. Your language is different. Again, your body language is different. The tools that you have for saying what you need are different. You have other people around you that you can have to reinforce, because sometimes with your kids, especially if you didn't start out from a trust-based space, they might need to hear it from someone else, right? Like how many people have had experience with that? I've said it to you 50,000 times, but when your auntie said it or your friend said it, somehow it made sense, right? You learn in de-schooling not to resent that. You look at these fevers, as resources as opposed to something to, to squash. Whenever there is turmoil, whenever there is conflict, there is also opportunity. But we are schooled to believe that turmoil is something you hide or something you try to squash. Whereas very much in that de-schooling space, it becomes different. It says, I get frustrated when you do this. So, if I'm not going to operate from a space of force or violence, I am still frustrated. That didn't change. I'm still really upset. But I'm going to look at what is upsetting me. I'm going to look at maybe even my role in it. And I'm going to look at different ways to practice what it might look like for us to be in a relationship where I don't feel like what you're doing is not okay. Because that's okay for us to feel like that too as parents. Don't, don't let it. Again, these unschooling streets fool you into thinking that it means that parents just shut up and figure out how to be nice so that kids can feel okay. That's not what it is. It's partnership. And partnership means that both people get to feel free and safe. Now, it's a particular type of partnership because as the parents, we have the privilege. But it also doesn't mean that we just take, you know, whatever's happening from our kids. It, it says that we learn to be mindful, conscionable, and develop practices from being in right relationship with our kids and from being in community with other people. We develop de-schooling tools that help us with the process. So I encourage you guys to check out the site, you know, the self-directed.org for that. Um, also look at how to focus on learning. It's a very, like, uh, it, we center people who are not very familiar with self-directed education. And then I have other courses that go much further in. But the first, the main thing really is community. You cannot do it by yourself. You cannot, in my opinion, intuit all of the tools and be doing the work. It's too much. It's too much. You have to figure out what community looks like for you. And it may not look like what you thought community looked like. It might not be your mom group. Like for me, it was like not any of the mom groups at all. <laughs> Uh, for me, it was a podcast. You know, we felt so alone in what we were doing because, again, as Caribbean people, it was like, hmm, why are you giving us so much space? No, you know, it's like this idea that your kid was going to end up being crazy, you know, or beating you up or whatever. And it's like, it's not one or the other. It's not one or the other. Like, I had to tell myself that a bunch of times as well. <laughs>
So um, I don't know how useful that will be for Melissa. When she stepped out, uh, oh, there you are. So just a starting point to one, recognize that there's no timeline on your de-schooling journey. You, you said months. Ha! <laughs> Congratulations and also ha! Because <laughs> it's, it's really early in the game, Melissa. Keep going. Um, and re recognize, like, give yourself the space to feel your feelings, to feel your feelings, and to continue to seek out community and be in spaces like this where you can talk to other people and get more in touch with your intuition around what it might look like for your de-schooling process to continue because, um, just getting started. Any other questions around any other aspects of self-directed education? Do you feel like you have um, like a good general idea of what it is and how it looks in some spaces? Because I'm wondering, good, good, good. Yes. How are we on time? Because I'm, I'm really kind of It might mean that we have to move. 
it might mean that we have to be in spaces where I'm being really honest and open about what our money situation is because society penalizes you for not having money or not pretending you have money. It means that I'm gonna have to be really honest about what my needs are and try to seek out community where people, where other people are doing that as well because it's not gonna be sustainable otherwise. So those are some of the ways that I've seen people shift their everyday experience to match now what it is that they need, which is a focus on being in a different type of relationship with their children. Sometimes it's as a result of, you know, the kids not thriving in school, you know, having emotional issues with school. So it's that. It's also um, entrepreneurialism. You know, in some cases, looking at the skills that you have or looking at ways that you can support the skills that other people have so that a group of you, if one person can't afford to pay two people who are retired to hold the space so that you can bring in folks three days a week to have this collective, then maybe everybody can pitch in $50 a month. It, that's what it looks like. It looks like organizing around community and away from a, a, a focus on just money over to a broader idea of what currency is, and community is currency, not just money. So that's a big, big part of the issue. Any other burning questions, y'all? Okay, all right, cool. Thank you so much. This was good. I feel like we're all really engaged.